one in five men ages 15 to 39 have low testosterone. It may even be you watching. This is a serious problem that could lead to potentially a difficult problem for all of humanity. We're going to discuss with the TRT expert why this might be happening and what we can do about it. So keep watching. Well, hi, I'm back with my friend, Dr. Rudy Eberwein. He's back with us in Miami. We're here to discuss some serious issues about the drop in men's testosterone and fertility and how the two are linked, all due potentially, and we'll talk about EDCs. And so Dr. Rudy, thank you for being here with us. And we're happy to discuss this topic so that we can get the awareness out to everyone that this isn't a laughing matter. I think I shared with you, you know, from my experience with the medical mind field, part of the Daily Mail, where the podcasts, they brought up the topic and they too recognize that, you know, the levels of testosterone are falling in men. So what do you think about this, uh, this attitude towards at least this cavalier attitude, at least from the British side, they give me your response and then what we can do and tell everyone what EDCs, environmental toxins are, so that you leave. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. I'm glad to be here again. I really enjoy your talks. A, a lot to unpack here. Yeah. So the first thing is, there's no questions that testosterone deficiency, low T, is increasing in incidence. We're seeing it more in older men, middle-aged men, but now we're seeing it even in the younger population. So I remember when I used to hear conventional medicine endocrinologists in this country laugh off that there's a burgeoning industry of low T clinics. And they were laughing that they were, you know, those young men who are going to those low T clinics. It's just because they wanted bigger muscles, they wanted, they wanted to get juiced. Well, now we're seeing it, it's becoming more and more of a problem. In my practice, the average age of my patient is 38. So, it, it, so again, you know, in my talk younger. I talked about, yeah, yeah so what, what, we use, what I learned in medical school is that testosterone deficiency happens if you have a genetic condition like Klinefelter's syndrome. Mm -hmm or if you've had some kind of trauma. pituitary sure. trauma or cancer like a prolactinoma or testicular cancer or testicular radiation. So those were the main things. And then if not, it's you get low T as you get older, late onset hypogonadism. So my patients that I started treating 15 years ago for testosterone were middle-aged and older men, but we're seeing younger and younger men coming with those symptoms. And I remember when they were laughing saying, oh, those patients, is it true hypogonadism? Yeah. It, it's, it's, you cannot laugh at patients like this. You know, I've said that in my talk. Um, a lot of guys, young men, will see they don't feel well. They are tired. They have low energy, low motivation, depression, mm. low sex drive. They do their own research because their doctor's not helping them. No. They're like, maybe it's testosterone. Let me go and I ask my, my GP. When they go there, they make fun of them. They laugh yeah. them out. And that's the tea shaming. And it's usually an endocrinologist with a meat yes. curtain who's probably not in the best shape. Sorry, I keep saying that word. Who's, who's not in the best the shape that, that's uh, mocking them. Yeah, but what a disservice we're doing to those young men. You know, they are yeah. coming to you. Already it's hard for a man to go to the doctor and admit that they're not feeling well. Now you have this young man who's coming in. And I say young men, you know, 30s and 40s, because that's still young to have yes. low tea. Um, they are coming to, to, to the clinic and they are saying their symptoms. And they're being laughed at. They're being telling them, no, it's in your head. That's the medical gaslighting. Or if yeah. they ask for testosterone, they're saying, no, you don't need it. Tea shaming. It, it, it's horrible that we're doing this to our patients. I, I love that word, tea shaming. And, and what was the other one? Tea phobia. Tea phobia. Yeah, the testosterone shaming. A lot of doctors will tell their, their patients, why are you trying to get on testosterone? Or you just want to get muscles? Or you want to, you know, like you, you're just, you're cheating. No. Just like if you have diabetes and you need insulin, there shouldn't be no shaming in, in having a medication that you need. The big question is, it's happening. I don't care who's laughing it off, who yeah. doesn't want to believe it, the studies are there. So uh, I think it's pretty common knowledge now that testosterone is dropping. So the, the numbers being thrown out there is about 1% a year after the age of 30. So this mm -hmm. statistic that you said, the one in five in adolescents and young adult men, and that was done in America, that have a 20%, a one in five percent incidence, a one in five incidence of low T. That study was done out of University of Miami. I mean, that's what's really powerful is if you think a 15 year old, 16, 17, we're talking the prime of their life. Prime of their life. You know, growing, that's when everything, stem cells are young, you know, good epigenetics. Yeah. And then this problem with low T, they feel like, and we've heard from some yeah. patients that, you know, they've not reached puberty, they're not in the body that they ought to be. This is terrible. Many men don't recognize this, or even teenagers. They don't. 
and, and what's the easy treatment that you go to your GP, they give you an antidepressant, an yeah. SSRI. Because there's no, you don't need to check a number. So once the, the man keeps complaining, I don't feel good, I'm tired, I'm depressed, they'll give an SSRI, which makes everything worse. So again, I want to go over that study because I don't okay. want you know, your audience to think we just pulled that number out of nowhere. So Dr. Ramasamy and Dr. Lokeshwar, Dr. Ramasamy is at the University of Miami. He's a urologist. He's a urologist. Yeah. He's the chief of reproductive urology at the University of Miami. And I have an interview that maybe you can put the link in, on yeah, YouTube yeah. that we have where we interviewed him for two hours. Because that was a mind-boggling statistic to me. I was like, wow, finally conventional medicine is talking about what we've been seeing in the real world. Because when I was seeing those patients, I'm like, really, are they kind of faking? Is yeah. it true? Do they really just want to get big muscles? But when you sit down and you talk to those young men, they're not doing well. And they're asking, what's going on? And the symptoms, what's interesting in that study with Ramasami, first they saw that the symptoms of low teen, that younger generation, weren't always sexual problems. It was mostly low energy, low motivation, mm. feeling tired and not wanting to do much. How many of those 20 and 30 year old that you see like this, right? One yeah, in five, five. Yeah. think about One this, five. right? So now those symptoms were mostly this. Some of them that had no problem getting an erection, but it was the drive. Uh, they do also have a higher incidence of erectile dysfunction. Mm. And number two, that those symptoms started at about the 400 range. So if you look at the new ranges that you have in a lot of labs, the low end limit of normal is 264. So that's now that's if that's the guy yeah. comes in, his level is 310, they'll tell him, no, you're fine. It's in your head. Gaslighting. You don't have low T. That's, and that's tiny present. Yeah. Why don't we go to the root cause and try to see what is testosterone? Testosterone is so important for the brain of developing young men. It's not just about bigger muscles, more sex. Testosterone is one of the most important neuroactive steroids. So it's important for mood, for motivation, mental health. for mental health, their like anxiety, mm. depression. So some guys, when I put them on testosterone, they're scared of roid rage. Am I gonna get more aggressive? We tend to see the opposite. When you have low T, you tend to be more irritable, yeah, um, easy to snap. You, you, you get bothered by things very easily. Because when you go on testosterone, exactly, yeah. grumpy old men syndrome in your thirties, yeah. in your twenties, it's not normal. And then you talked in the last video about VAT. Yes, visceral <laughs> adipose <laughs> tissue. Yeah, again, and, lower testosterone has a direct correlation with increased visceral adipose tissue and increased risk of chronic um, disease, metabolic disease, um, diabetes, prediabetes, metabolic syndrome, heart attacks. So now I, I like to call it the low T generation. We have a generation of young men, again, we see 20% even from the age of 15, that are having hormonal imbalances, and then everything that comes after that, the increase in VAT, the depression, and, and all of those other symptoms, where are those young men going to be at 45 and 50 years old? Not in right? a good place. Not, not in a, a good, good place. place. If they're not recognized. And this is, this is the next generation. As you were saying, those, were, those are their prime years. This is when they should be their best. This is when they should be forming their careers and doing everything. And by the time they are 40, 50, they can rest. They don't even have that surge of testosterone. Testosterone in psychological studies has been shown testosterone is what helps you reach a higher social status, not just in humans, in primates and in any animals. So with men having lower testosterone levels, you can imagine, they're not even looking for a higher social status. They're not even looking to mate. How many yeah. young men do you see now? They don't want to have children. No, I think you're referring to maybe the incel. Uh, some of the, that's another group. That's but, another but, group. Is there but, an issue but is there? That, maybe they have low T. Yes. It, it, again, it's never one thing. I don't like to oversimplify, yeah. especially when it comes to endocrinology, human behavior. But hormones are the most important thing. I always thought that somebody's personality is fixed. This is who you are. You kind of did that as you mm. grew up. Hormones have such an important role in our psychology, and, our behavior, that if you have a hormone insufficiency, it plays a big role on who and, you are. And you've seen the transformation in your patients. My God. From, and I, I've seen as well some, some men that were quite, quite meek or not, not really sure. Timid. And then the next thing you know, they say, oh, I started a new business. I'm <laughs> so the example of my around. patient, yeah. John, he, he was able to start his own law firm once he was optimized. Again, not just testosterone, and it, it's a cycle, right? Yeah. When they don't feel well, you get a guy with low T who has increased fat, increased belly fat, is too tired to work out, is in a downward spiral yeah. of feeling bad. The worse you feel, the, more, the worse you identify as a lazy bum. So now he doesn't want to do anything. Um, most of those patients who, who come to me, 
they told me their doctor called them lazy and non-compliant. They come to me, if they have low T, replace the station, now they have positive energy. Now they want to work out. They are gaining yeah. muscle. They are losing weight. They are more motivated. They achieve better. So, yeah, instead of having somebody go down that negative spiral, let's put him on a positive cycle of behavior. Give him Absolutely. the right hormones, the right fuel, and you will see how everything like this changes. So let's talk about then what is the cause. And before we get to that, actually before that part, is the linkage with fertility. Completely. And that was what really inspired, well, it's really interesting that in the talk that you gave, how your fertility is dropping mm -hmm. and the testosterone is dropping at the same rate. And the two are linked, and the two shouldn't be separate. And the and the damage to humanity, or the or the complications that will will rise if we want to maintain the population, it will be very expensive to have children in future. Yeah. So what? Um, well, so first, infertility is a huge problem. It's becoming worse. Actually, the WHO, the World Health Organization, put out a statistic that about seventeen point five percent, or one in six people, not just women, people trying to to conceive have problems with fertility. Before, infertility was always the burden of the woman. If they cannot have kids, it's the woman's fault. Now the studies are showing that male infertility is increasing significantly. So male infertility accounts for about 30% of a couple's infertility. And why this is happening? Because of a decline in sperm count. Dr. Shana Swan, she's an epidemiologist at Harvard who's been doing 30 plus years of research. And she has an amazing uh, study that I, that I cited, and she has an amazing book called Countdown. I strongly suggest everybody to read this. We also did an interview yeah. with her, and I saw you, that. you, you yeah. know we can we put, put a link, link. Put the link into your uh, because video, exa yeah. I was seeing that, so I saw those young men with low T, and I'm like, something's happening. Right. There. Then I started seeing more young men with infertility. Are those two separate silos? They're not. The commonality of those two is that both testosterone and sperm count are made from the HPG axis, the hypothalamus pituitary gonadal axis. So something's affecting that axis, that tree, right? Yes. So, so if you have low T, more infertility, something's affecting this. So, and there's no question it's affecting it. So Dr. Shana Swan studies that's been published in 2017, and she went viral when she first published mm -hmm. those because it's been a 52% decline in sperm count over the past 40 years. So 52%. 52%. That's a ridiculous amount. And she said that if things continue like this, although you can't predict the future, what's going right. to happen, but if that, that uh, rate continues, by the year 2050, more than 75% of couples will need some kind of assisted reproduction, IVF, IUI, anything like yeah. this. Already, I don't know how it is in the UK, but IVF and infertility business is the one, the most... The, one of the uh, fastest growing yeah. branches of medicine. the same in the UK and, and massive waiting list if you try to yes, get it on the NHS. Yes. So. And now anybody like listening there, yeah. they'll be like, oh yeah, my friend was trying to get pregnant having problems. Everybody knows somebody who's having problems conceiving. So it is a huge problem. But if we look at it by itself, first by itself, it's a huge problem. Not only because, as you said, less uh, births, this is a threatening thought for our species because are we going to be able to maintain our population? Yeah. Number two is having a low sperm count. It doesn't just translate into poor fertility. It also translates into poor health outcomes for the men. So lower uh, sperm count has been linked to more chances of chronic diseases like diabetes, prediabetes, heart disease, and even early death in men. So the low sperm count is a marker for chronic health. So exactly. now you have a young man who has low testosterone, low sperm count, increased belly fat. Where's this guy going to be in 30 years? It's going to cost the public health system a exactly, fortune. Exactly, exactly. So. And not only poor outcome for him, yeah. for his family, for his employment, for his society, but the cost of dealing with those, those men when they're going to develop those diseases, when they're going to need assisted reproduction, even looking at this from that angle, it's scary. So focusing on prevention will make, make all the difference to nip in the bud the fertility crisis as well as the low testosterone, which are linked. I'm not saying that everyone needs to be put on testosterone, but we need to find the source of why this is dropping. And one of those, I think, from um, some of the studies were these endocrine, endocrine disrupting disorder. hormones or, or chemicals. Yeah. And so, so that's really important. Again, when I was doing my talk and, and the way my mind went, so when I found those two silos, I was like, those cannot be two separate silos. They have something in common. That's the HPG axis. That, that, that's the endocrine system that makes both testosterone and sperm. 
something's affecting it. But it's going too fast to say that this is just evolution. This is just a gene pool that's changing. Over 40 years that we've seen that change, that's too fast. And Dr. Shana Swan said it in her book. She said, first, those are parallel manifestations of the same disturbance. Mm. Parallel. That's groundbreaking. And what is that disturbance cannot be our gene pools, cannot be evolution. It has to be the environment. Yeah. And what in our environment has happened over the past 40, 50 years? The rise of chemicals, toxins, endocrine disrupting chemicals. And she was able to, again, in her book, because she's followed patients for so yeah. long, that she was able to link certain chemicals, especially the anti androgenic chemicals, that directly affect health, sexual and reproductive health. So she showed that women who had higher levels of phthalates, for example, which is a plasticizer, had less chance of conceiving or going to the end. Like the more, the more, the higher the level of phthalates in a man urine, the lower is sperm count. And that, that holds true for all, all kinds of different EDCs, phthalates, BPA, another class of chemicals called the per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFAS. Those are the ones forever they call forever chemicals. chemicals. Yeah. And I was just showing you, there's an article that came in from that showed Lancashire. in the Lancashire yeah. River. Yeah. There's a chemical company that's dumping 800 kilograms of forever chemicals in, 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 the, in one of the rivers. Yeah, so much for all the regulation in the UK. I yes. mean, the UK is the most allegedly overregulated, but not when it's the mates of, uh, of some of the political parties. Yes. And, they, and, and they've been also dumping sewage in the sea. Yes, so it's crazy. It, it's, um, and, and you know what's hard? It's, the thing is, because those toxins, we've never studied them. The way the, the, the chemicals are, are usually released in, in our society is that a company comes up with a chemical, they find some use to it. They will kind of define first, it's, it's, it's bad until they can prove that it's toxic. And the way they determine the toxicity is usually they do acute toxicity. The dose makes the poison. So they usually will go over the dose that's acute. They'll dilute that chemical. And the lower dose, they're like, this is safe. But this is an acute uh, phase. Not looking so up. we don't know what's happening with chronic low doses of those chemical exposure over long periods of times. We know what's happening. I, I cited that, st that study about atrazine. Uh, yeah. It is banned in the EU. I'm not sure about the UK, but we're still using it in, in the US. It should still be banned unless they lifted I'm that re restriction. I'm hoping. We were just under the EU prior to Brexit, but so hopefully that is the case. Yeah. And that's what I think still UK agriculture, for the most part, beef is usually grass fed. That's amazing. I'm not sure if it's grass finished, but usually grass fed throughout the way. And many of the chemicals that were banned by the EU, I think are still bad yeah. because they haven't done the bonfire of, of regulation that they were planning on after Brexit mm -hmm. because it's going to take too much, too many bureaucrats to, yeah. to go sift through all that yeah. and change it. Which is a good thing. Again, when I was looking at it, in the US, we're much more liberal with those chemical companies. Out of the 80,000 plus chemicals that are in use, yeah. at least in the EU, I'm always yeah, yeah. going to say EU, about 1,300 of them are banned. You know how many are banned in the US? Less than 12. That's not good. Less than 12. That's incredible. And what's interesting, in, in your presentation, you put up a slide that uh, there was used by the chemical industry as a marketing ploy called Better Living Through Chemistry. Now, my dad used to say that because he didn't understand what's taking all these vitamins and testosterone. <laughs> and he said, you're one of those better living through chemistry people. <laughs> so yeah. it really struck a chord with yes, me when I saw yes, it. <laughs> yes. And you know, that was a different yeah. chemistry. So that was a company called DuPont. Yeah. And 1935 came up with that slogan. And there's no question, chemistry has made our life easier. Chemistry has helped us with progress. Where would we be without, without our plastics? Where would we be without the pesticides? How would we feed the, you know, yep. 10 billion people we have on this earth, right? right. We, it, we, we kind of need some things like this. But we're dealing now with the unintended consequences of our industrialization. Mm. Um, there are mass extinctions of different animals. I know glyphosate, when it was banned in Germany, yeah. it's because it, they noticed that it was uh, killing the insects, the bees. Yeah. Because um, they couldn't reproduce. They couldn't yeah. reproduce. And, and, no, and, and it was also cytotoxic, yeah. could not reproduce. So I know, so we know that insects are dying by large amount of numbers. We're losing so many of our animals. But what was interesting is Homo sapiens, our species, has been the most destructive species of every animal. And it's because we can create so many chemicals. Mm. But now what's interesting and scary is we're not just affecting the planet. 
we know climate change. Again, we're not going to go, right, it's climate right, right. change yeah. man-made, is it a cycle? But there's no question that the planet is suffering. There's no question that animals are dying. And now there's no question that our species is suffering. Yeah. What's causing all this? Is it evolution again? No, we've evolved over millions of years and our species always did well. Why is our species suffering so much? Better living through chemistry? Or poisoning Honestly, ourselves. Yes, with poisoning ourselves <laughs> yeah. with chemistry. Yeah. With chemistry that has helped us. So the big question, we can't undo progress. We can't go back to not using plastic, no light, no cell phone. Yeah. But can we do and put pressure on those companies into finding safer products and doing it? And I feel like this is what needs to be said. Until we talk about it, we won't see there's a problem. Once you realize there's a problem, then you can put smart minds into creating safer products. But the first thing, we cannot be laughing at EDCs causing low testosterone. Yeah. This is no laughing matter. No, absolutely. So shame on you, medical minefield. Again, Daily I don't know mail. anything about UK, <laughs> but we yeah, cannot they, be laughing about no, this. Seriously, yeah. yeah. So one of the interesting points you made in, in your talk, in your presentation, was there are things we can do individually. We can vote with our feet, vote with our wallets, and, and make the right choices. It's hard. Because he said it's so ubiquitous, it's all around us, and you made uh, you painted a very nice picture of the day in the life of <laughs> one of your patients. You yes. want to tell us about that a bit? Because yeah, it's so eloquent the way you put it. Yeah. So, so unfortunately, those eighty thousand chemicals are everywhere. They're in everything. One interesting statistic, not statistic, like even receipts, thermal receipts that you get from the pharmacy. They give you a receipt, you hand right. it. With your hands, those thermal receipts, they have phthalates and plasticizers and forever chemicals in it. Yeah. So even then, you can try to do everything you have. You touch the receipt and you get exposed okay, to chemicals. Right. And you said you wake up, you have your shower. Yeah. You so let me go yeah, over yeah, that, so you, yeah. a day in the life of a typical <laughs> <love> person. <laughs> yeah. Right? So you wake up, you go in the shower. Plastic, shower curtain, lined with vinyl. Vinyl has a lot of forever chemicals but because it repels water. You can even smell the plastic. Mm, yeah. Whenever you smell plastic, you're inhaling chemicals. Then, you know, that guy smells plastics, yeah. going to his shower, uses shampoo, scented shampoo, scented soap, washes his teeth, all of those full of chemicals. It can be done better. There are some companies who are doing all of those products without parabens, without phthalates. Mm. It can be done. We just need to be aware of this. That's Number two, yeah. so this guy now yeah. keeps getting exposed before he even leaves his house. The new car smell I used to love. Oh, yeah, when you go in a car, the new car smell, it's plastic. <laughs> That, that you're smelling, all those air fresheners that are being mm. used everywhere, full of phthalates, full of forever chemicals, so you're smelling them. You go and have lunch somewhere, there you try to be healthy, you eat a good salad or you have a soup, they give it to you in a plastic cup. You drink your coffee, everybody's drinking coffee yeah. now, yeah. and the more, the more, um, the, most people are trying to give it to me in a carton cup, I don't want yes, plastic. Yeah. The inside of it is lined even though it's, with plastic. Even Although it's, it's, it's like paper on yeah, the outside. Yeah, it's paper on the outside. You've got this chemical on the, the inside. chemical, and the hot liquid makes it leach even more. When you can water yes, bottles, because yes. we want to stay hydrated, a lot of times you keep that water bottle in your car. Yeah. It gets hot. leaches more plastics, okay. right? Then you go and get your, your, your meat. Although the meat could be raised... Um, grass you, fed, you said yeah. grass fed, but it's always wrapped. plastic. All the veg, always wrapped in, in the UK, a lot of the fruit and veg, most of it. You don't yeah. see it in the US as often, where it's all fresh on the shelves and being you know, sprinkled with the water. It's, everything's prepackaged out of convenience and yeah. plastic. Yeah. So, so, so first we need to talk about this. Yeah. People need to be aware about it. What's scary is that it's overwhelming. When you see the, the how ubiquitous those chemicals are, a lot of my friends when I talk about this, they're like, oh. I'll die of something. This is too overwhelming. I'm going to be like the ostrich. I'm going to put my head in the sand, live my life, and whatever will happen will happen. I, I understand this, and I've had those reactions, mm -hmm. but then I was like, no. We need educated consumers, and it starts with all of us. We can change each one of us. So I've looked at my life. How can I change some of my habits? So let me give you a few practical okay. things we can do. Number one is the water that we drink. I don't trust the municipal water. I don't know how the water no, is in I the UK, trust it either. but there's a lot of chemicals in that. So it needs to be filtered. Number two, the air that we breathe inside of our house. Our microplastics, phthalates, have, have been found to be microparticles that we can breathe. Even in our clothes. Even in our clothes, yeah. especially if there's water repellent, stain repellent, like the, the carpet. Yes. If you do some kind of stain repellent on it, those are forever chemicals. Mm. So all of this. So for sure, water filtration. Try to do something with the air, some kind of air filter. Don't use anything that's 
water repellent, water resistant. Stain. You know what? Clean your stuff. If your clothes get wet, that's okay. Yeah. Try not to use plastic for food containers as much as possible. Mm. And if you're using plastic, make sure you don't put that in the microwave or hot foods yeah. in it. Fragrances. Try to avoid fragrances as much as you can. I love to use my cologne. I yeah. like to smell good. Eau de toilette. Uh, yeah. Eau de toilette. <laughs> just, you know, all of those things, they're full of chemicals. Yeah. So I, you can't escape them 100%. But even if you can do a 5% decrease of exposure, mm. 10% decrease, and they slowly work your way up. Of course, you need to educate yourself. We, we don't have enough education. When I talk about this, people are like, where can I go? What website? <laughs> yeah. What app? Yeah. So I'm also developing websites. There, there's one in the U.S. called the EWG, Environmental Working Group. It's a nonprofit that lists a lot of those products, and it gives you a very easy rating to see which one is the least toxic. And even starting with this, it's the more education, the more empowered we are as a consumer, the better we can vote. And, and buy products. And now we put pressure on, on the companies to make safer products. It's possible. Yeah. But it starts with us demanding it, us knowing about Absolutely. it and demanding it. There's so much to do. And sometimes you think about, you know, maybe when we were younger, I remember you had brown paper bags, not mm -hmm. plastic. Um, things were done with glass, more wood, more metal, yes. but not so much plastic, especially for the things that we touch and consume every day. Yeah, you know, some of the drinks, uh, soft drinks were put in glass yes. and then you would then take you them back them. and you yes. recycle it. So, you know, we, we think we're modern because we can recycle now, but it's been going on well before this. Before this. And then some of the big industries changed this, uh, this non-reusable plastic yeah. and that's but gone everywhere. Let me tell you a scary yeah. number. About 380 million pounds of plastics are produced a year. 50% of this is one single-use plastic yeah. that we throw away. How much of this is recycled? Less than 5%. All that plastic, so it's easy for us when we live in, in, in an urban center, mm. right? You get rid of the plastic, you put it in your bin, you get rid of it, you're like, oh, I got rid of it, it's no longer in my home. Yeah. But it's still in your planet. It's gonna come back to you because this is gonna degrade into microplastics it's going to be eaten by the fish. It's going to be eaten by, by this. And then we end up eating that. And then the circle comes in. Mm. And microplastic, what's bad with plastics? It's not people think, yeah, you know, like they, they, they do a lot. In Netflix, they have a really good um, show called Plastic Ocean. And they, they focused more, mostly on how plastics are killing fish and birds because they're eating it. They, they get stuff in their stomach. Mm. And it's killing the fauna. And, and they're more focused on this. But it gets to the humans. And with humans, when you consume microplastic, it's an estrogenic compound. So it's estrogen-based. So microplastic, I think it's estimated that the average person eats about a credit card worth of plastic per year. Would you eat a credit card? No. Right? So, and what's bad with plastics? Yeah. Not just that it can obstruct your intestine, be in your stomach. Those are estrogenics. And I talked to you about the endocrine system, how delicate it is. Even a small concentration of too much of a hormone is bad. So that's why you say men, males, tend to be more susceptible for this. Because most of those, plus, those toxins are estrogenics, meaning they, they, are, they have estrogen type action. When a man gets too much estrogen, mm. it shuts down their HPG it's axis. Excess. It shuts down the testosterone production. And that is the link that Shana Swan and most of the toxicologists um, are seeing, is the more estrogen a man gets exposed to, the lower the level of testosterone, the lower their sperm count. Another great book I'm going to recommend, it's called Astral Generation. Yeah, I just mentioned Anthony J. Anthony J. We interviewed yeah, him also. Yes, I, I saw that, so I'll put that in. Yes. So what I think I saw or read with the Anthony J. book that was a, or mentioned in one of the podcasts he did was that not only are these, I don't know, the EDCs, estrogenic blocking the pituitary axis, but it's also blocking the androgen receptor. Completely. You know, causing. Yeah. So, so you're in not my receive, talk, yeah. I talked about the mechanisms of action, right? right. So some chemicals mimic estrogen. So, and then they cause the negative feedback loop into the HPG axis. Other ones are complete, completely anti-endogenic. Other ones block the endogen receptors. There's even some studies that show that they decrease the density of the receptors. Mm. And that's the problem, as you are saying, with the CAG repeat. Right? Yeah. Well, it's, it's creating a form of testosterone resistance. resistance. And so it, you can yeah. have all of this testosterone lying yeah. around. Um, to get the biological action, you need testosterone that binds to the endogen receptor. Then you get the biological action. Yeah. So I don't care how much testosterone you have, if you don't have the right receptors, the right amount right. of receptors, or if the receptors are blocked, 
no. cannot get the biological action. So yeah, we were talking about in another video we, we talked about with Dr. Rob the um, the CAG repeats mm -hmm. on the androgen receptor, and these are something that we'd like to be able to measure for but for those patients. And this is probably aside from from the chemicals. Just some people naturally have long CAG repeats, and some have short CAG repeats. I and mean, you're right; maybe we don't know yet how those are influenced by endocrine disrupting mm -hmm. hormones. But those who have long CAG repeats are considered that they may require higher levels of testosterone, or the levels need to be higher for them to be symptom free. And those who have short CAG repeats are very sensitive to certain amounts of testosterone; they need a lot less. Mm -hmm. So that could be another potentially, hopefully, someday diagnostic tool. For those mystery patients who come in with complaints of low testosterone, but you look at the range and even liberal range, you know, over 15 animals per liter, they yeah. still have symptoms. And you're like, yeah. well, we've got to do something for them. Yeah. So, and that's amazing that those developments are happening because this is going into the era of personalized medicine, yes. where we don't just take one number and see, okay, this is the same for everybody. So if you can do a genome sequencing and you see the CAG repeat, and then you can personalize your treatment to that patient. Until this is available, the way I deal with it is, and, and we, we've discussed that before, endocrinology used to be a symptom-based mm -hmm. specialty. Before we had tests for thyroid or for testosterone levels, uh, a patient would come to a doctor. There wasn't, you know, back in the 1940s, maybe there wasn't a, a spe specialties like this. But you take a list of symptoms and you generate a differential diagnosis. So let's say a young a, a man comes to me, he's tired, he has low libido, he can gain muscle. In your mind, you're thinking, is that testosterone? Is that thyroid? You generate your differential diagnosis. You didn't have blood tests at this time for this, and you do a therapeutic trial. So yeah. if you think it's testosterone, you give him a little bit of testosterone, and you see a clinical response. If they responded, you got your diagnosis. Yeah. Thyroid used to be like this. Yes. If you think somebody was hypothyroid before the blood test was available, you again, this is when the art of medicine was important. You, you, you listen to the patient, you ask the pertinent questions, you come up with a differential diagnosis, and you go by process of elimination. The most likely diagnosis, you do a therapeutic trial with it. If you get an answer, you got your diagnosis, and mm -hmm. then you follow. So endocrinology went from a symptom-centered specialty to now a numbers centered yeah, just specialty. Always tracing the pathway to no end. No so end, that, and, that, and, and the numbers. <laughs> if you're two points, so, one point well, above the number. You don't, clearly, you don't have it. You don't then. have this. And so, what is it again? Medical gaslighting. Yeah. That's not it. It's in your head. Heal some entire So diseases. endocrinologists, you need to be defrocked, <laughs> renamed, and called mediocre diabetes specialists. Because oh, Lord, I don't know if I'm going to go that far, Michael. Oh, 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 you know, I, 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 but the good endocrinologists <laughs> out there, they yes. will understand the benefits. And we want to hear from you if you're exactly. a good endocrinologist, because we want you on our side, because uh, that's what we want. And, and you know, and, yeah. th for doctors, it's hard to unlearn what you've learned, yeah. right? It, it, it's really, uh, it, it's been really difficult for me, because when I went in med school in the early 90s, I learned that testosterone is bad. Testosterone is going to give you prostate cancer. You yeah. know, that study was by, based out of three patients by Huggins um, who got a Nobel Prize for this. That's what was the invented. phosphatase test, yes, not the PSA. Was, not yeah. even a PSA. <laughs> so because of that one study on three patients, you had generations of doctors who learned that testosterone causes prostate cancer to never take that. So I, I went to med school knowing this. So for me to make that, sh that shift to thinking testosterone causes prostate cancer and being scared of it, or to only know that testosterone, low T, testosterone deficiency only happens to older men, it took me a major shift. Mm -hmm. I had to humble myself yeah. and relearn. I went to a lot of conferences like the AMMG, and I learned that it is different. And the more I practice clinically, the more I see this, but I cannot have the same thinking that when I, what I learned in 1990 is yes, the same, same that I have to use today yeah. in 2020s with our toxic world. It is a different world in a different way of thinking about patients, generating differential diagnosis. We need to bring back the art of medicine where Absolutely. doctors can really listen to a patient, get to a, not a conclusion, a differential diagnosis, and try different things. The, the medicine cannot be a cookbook specialty. No, unfortunately, in some big health centers like the NHS, that's what it's turned into. And I don't know if it's because of cost containment, because uh, the bureaucrats or administrators are, are managing it, but not understanding the art of medicine and, th and that needs to change. And I think there's going to be a groundswell over time for it to change back, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the way it usually changes, it's when somebody influential develops low T at a young age, yeah. <laughs> and he tries and it's like, oh my God, and it changes. A lot of the doctors, me included, mm -hmm. have no shame in saying, at 48 years old, I developed testosterone deficiency. 
Um, I, I was 48, I was healthy, never needed medication, yeah. always worked out. My nutrition was decent. And at 48, mm -hmm. I found the symptoms that my patients were having. I was tired, my drive went down, my wife and I were becoming just roommates. <laughs> I oh, had no yeah, interest. Yeah, no, sure. um, at that, I didn't even have time for my kids. I was getting a little more belly fat. Mm. I'm like, what's happening with me? I, I'm getting old. Yeah. Is that what getting old is? I was getting almost 50. And I checked my numbers. I was in the lower limit of, of normal. Remember that very well. My testosterone was 385. Yeah. Normal is 300 to 1200. Well, it used to be 400. It but used yeah. to be 400. But <laughs> when four, I, yeah. even me, I was T shaming myself. Tough, yeah, I was see. saying, no, I don't no. need it. I'm just trying. To, when I went on testosterone, it's a complete life changer. Mm. Better physical energy, better mental energy, better sexual energy. And we need all three of this to Absolutely. really be the best of ourselves. Why should I accept that you're getting old at 48? Why did my patient John, John accept that he was getting old at 35? If there's a way that we can help optimize and be the best version of yourself, doing it the right way, following the right parameters, and we know that testosterone replacement therapy, when done right, yeah. with the right follow-up, with the right supplements, it's beneficial. Yeah. It helps you decrease belly fat, that decrease risk of heart disease because you have lower body fat, it helps with maintaining cognition, with stronger bones. So if you do it the right way, you know, I'm not saying testosterone is a panacea and every man who's getting older should get it. But if you see a deficiency associated with the right clinical symptoms, the benefits definitely yeah. outweigh the risk. Yeah. And I'm a witness. I'm no, a absolutely. I'm a testimony yeah. And you were doing everything this. right at the time. Yes, so. I was. So why don't we... Yeah, why don't why we, did I uh, develop this? Exposure to chemicals potentially finally exactly. caught up with you. Yeah, you know, maybe not in the womb. Like, unfortunately, some yes. young generation may be exposed to EDCs in the womb mm -hmm. or forever chemicals, yeah. as we've seen in studies. Yeah. They have it even worse. You had a leg up. Me too, most likely. Yeah. But as time goes on, we're still living on this planet exposed to these chemicals, and, and it's going to take its toll. It's probably what happened yeah. to my thyroid yeah. after all these years. I was on TRT, doing swimmingly, and then about five, six years ago, I wasn't getting the full benefit of the TRT. I was tired, knackered all the time. Mm -hmm. And that I have a thyroid problem, and fortunately, you know, my doctor practiced you know trial of treatment, and it completely blossomed and and improved. Yeah. Uh, LDL cholesterol went down. I felt a lot lot better. Yeah. And so it's amazing that I, I consider myself young. I'm yeah. 53. You look young. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, man. You, you're in your I'm late 48, 40s. Yeah. yeah. It's it's. I think our generation is saying, I'm not ready to be old. I'm not ready to be dismissed and then just say like, yeah, you have low energy, you're depressed. Just go say, sit on a swivel chair and watch TV. Yeah. Stop talking. No. Well, it's funny. The previous generations appear to look older around the same, the same time age, frame. The yes. ones that were in their 48, 50s look like yeah. their 70s in some yeah. pictures. Yeah. It, it, it's so, so I'm passionate about this. And when I see you, so my real passion is really to raise awareness about those younger men having it. This mm. epidemic of low testosterone I'm seeing in younger men. This epidemic of infertility that is happening. And how do we make the connection between those two? Then going further to see, yes, I cannot prove that only EDCs cause that, but they have to be part of the big picture that is a cause of those that the disturbance that we're seeing. And if we don't talk about it, we'll never do anything about it. Well, well said. Well, I think we'll leave it at that. And if anyone who's watching has a comment or question, uh, for Dr. Abbott Wine, for Dr. Rudy, please leave them in the comments below and do have a look at their channel at the Medical Health Institute. And uh, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and like, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Dr. Rudy. You're welcome. That was right, great. Good. Awesome.